really got. So let's go ahead and start talking about sigma notation. And there's a couple rules you should be aware of and also just the meaning in general. So the meaning of sigma or summation notation is literally that we are adding stuff up, right? So um, people like to use various indexes or subscripts. Um, usually I, J, K, M, and N are pretty standard um, choices. So if I want to find like the sum from I equals one to five of I squared plus two I, I could use some of the formulas. In fact, we'll probably circle back around to this example and do it with the formulas. But for now, I really just want to make sure everyone knows what this means. Right? This means we're starting at I equals one, we're ending at five, and we're getting all of the integers in between. Always the integer is never like half an integer, although there is a way you can kind of make that happen if you want to. So I'm going to say, so I'm going to start I equals one, I'm going to plug in one for each I, I'm going to get one squared plus two times one. And then I'm going to index, I'm going to increase my index to the next integer, which is two. So I take I equals two, I plug it in, I get two squared plus two times two. And I go to the next integer, which is three. I plug it in for I and I get three squared plus two times three. Then I do it for four. I get four squared plus two times four. And then I do it for five, which is the last one because that's my ending number. And I get five squared plus two times five. And we could calculate this. I mean, right, we could, it's, you know, one plus two plus four plus four plus nine plus six plus 16 plus eight plus 25 plus seven. That adds to something. What I actually want to show you, which I think is more important, is not what this adds up to, but how you can use this to see how things break apart. So what I want to show you is, well, I can, right, everything's added together here. I can add things in whatever order I want, right? Adding is a commutative operation, meaning it doesn't matter what order you do it in. So I'm simply going to take the first part to do this. I'm going to write this as one squared plus two squared plus three squared plus four squared plus five squared. Right? That's all these parts. And then I'm also going to have the two times one, two times two, two times three, two times four, two times five. And then I can actually factor out a two from each of these. So I could rewrite this as two times one plus two plus three plus four plus five. And now I can re-express these using sigma notation. I could write all of this as the sum from i equals one to five of i squared, right? It's one squared plus two squared plus three squared plus four squared, et cetera. And then I could write this as two times the sum from i equals one to five of i. So this kind of displays some of the rules I'm gonna write on the next side of the board. Um, we could also calculate this, right? I don't think we need to calculate this really, but one plus two plus two plus four is 15. 15 times two is 30. So this part is 30. And this part, one squared plus two squared plus two squared plus four squared plus five squared is, it's a number. <laughs> it's five times six times 11, right? I think it's 55. That's not really what's important. Let's see, 25 plus 16 plus nine is also 25. Yeah, it's 55. Doesn't mean that. So we get 85. Great. But here's what I want you to see from this. I want you to see that if you're taking the sum of some expression, you can one, if there's addition, you can break it up. And two, if there's a constant multiple, you can pull it out, right? So I broke up the sum of this plus this as the sum of this plus the sum of that. And then I also pulled out the coefficient of two or the constant multiple of two. So more generally, there's kind of two rules for sums that you should be aware of. Rule one, if you have the sum from i equals one to whatever, uh, sum a sub i plus b sub i. So a sub i could be our i squared and b sub i could be our two i, right? Some things that depend on i, you can break this up as the sum of a sub i plus the sum times one to n of b sub i. And 
You can do it for addition. You can also do it for subtraction. Just convenient. And then the other rule is that if you have the sum from i equals one to n of a constant times a sub i, that constant factors out. You can write this as the constant times the sum from i equals one to n of a sub i. Just like we did for this part here, right? The sum from i equals one to five of two i is equal to two times the sum from i equals one to five of i. Which makes sense, right? You can write the sum as two times one plus two plus three plus four plus five, or you can write it as two times one plus two times two plus two times three plus two times four plus two times five. It's the same expression either way, but one of them, right? One of them is written like this way where the two is factored out, and one of them is written like this, where the two isn't factored out, but they still get the same thing, right? This is two times that, and this is two plus four plus six plus eight plus 10, which is still the same thing, okay. So those are the two rules, and she was definitely using those in lecture, at least, well, so I was in the lecture right before this. She was using those in the one o'clock lecture for sure when she was breaking up her sums to kind of make it easier to simplify it. Like when she was doing that two i plus three over seven, which I square maybe plus three over seven, um, that's what she was doing. And then we have some formulas. And let's talk about what these formulas mean. So um, she kind of jumped straight to I squared. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get there in a minute, but I wanna talk about a couple other formulas first. So some formulas with summations. So the first one actually, and she's actually talking about this one as well, is if you take the sum from I equals one to N of just a constant. So there's nowhere to, to, to put that. Like this one here, this would be, if I was doing the sum from i equals one to n of a i, that would be a sub one plus a sub two plus a sub three plus a sub four, right? Because each time i increases, that i there has to change. But here, there's no i's. We're blind. No, there's no I, I always I always hear like people say no i. I'm like, oh you got no i's, ah. but there's no i's here. So I know, right? It's dumb. Um, so when i equals one, I get c. When i equals two, I get c. When i equals three, I get c. When i equals n, I get c. How many c's do I have? I have n of them. So c plus c plus c plus c plus c, n times is n times c. So whenever you have the sum of a constant, it's always just equal to the number of terms you have times that constant which is going to be n if you're starting i equals one to n to the n. If you start somewhere else, you have to kind of think about it. like, so for example, that's actually, here, here's a good question. If I do the sum from i equals three to eight of 10, how many terms do I have? I mean, you could probably count them up. I have less than eight because I'm starting at i equals three, not at i equals one. Five is a good guess, but it's actually incorrect. But so, so let me talk. So before anyone else guesses, oh, sorry. Yeah, so it is six. So you can either count them up, you can literally count them on your fingers, right? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's six terms. Um, so, but here's how I kind of think about it, right? I'm imagining somebody said five because they did eight minus three, which is a good thought. But here, if you think about it, if we, here we had n terms. If you do n minus one, you don't get n. So what you have to do is if you want to find the number of terms in a, ser in a, in a sum, you can do this minus that and then add one. So eight minus three is five plus one is six. N minus one is N minus one plus one is N. It's kind of like um, if you asked how many days there were, it, it, it's actually very similar to like calendars. If you ask how many days there were between like January 1st and January 31st, which is, it seems like a simple example, we know there's 31 days, but 31 minus one is 30. We have to add back one because of the weird kind of way counting works sometimes. This is the same idea. You have to add back one after you take the difference in the things. So this has six terms, so this would be six times 10, which is six, right? So it'd be 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10. Okay. Um, yeah. 
I wouldn't sweat this too much, but just wanted to point out that you don't have to always start at one most of the time we do. So there's a formula. Now let's talk about the next one, which is pretty cool, I think. And so I just want to make sure everybody knows what like, and so like when we say the sum from i equals one to n of i, there is a formula for this, which we're going to talk about in a second, but this has meaning to it, right? This literally means you're starting at one and then adding two and then adding three, and then adding four. And you keep doing this until you get to whatever n is, right? Maybe n is 20 or maybe n is three or maybe n is seven, right? N can be anything. So you can say it's like plus n minus two, plus n minus one, plus n. And there is a formula for this, which we'll derive. So here's the cool way to do it. So someone showed me something like, that's super really cool. Uh, so here's what I'm gonna do. The sum is equal to this. I'm gonna add another one. So I'm gonna have one plus two plus three plus all the way to n minus two plus n minus one plus n. Some people do this thing where they connect this and this and this and this, but I'm gonna do it a slicker way. I'm going to add this whole sum again. So plus, but I'm going to add it in the reverse order. So n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2 plus all the way to 3 plus 2 plus 1. Okay. So first of all, before we actually start adding this stuff together, this is twice this, right? I've added all the numbers from 1 to n two times. So this is going to equal two times the sum from i equals one to n of i. Is everybody okay with that? Are, there, are there any objections or questions? Okay. Now here's the slick part. What's one plus n? Wow. Okay, what's two plus n minus one? n plus one. What's three plus n minus two? What's three plus n minus two? What's two plus n minus one? What's n plus one? Now let me ask you guys, how many of these are there? How many things were there? N. N. So we have N plus one plus N plus one plus N plus one N times. That means we have N times N plus one. So two times the sum from I equals one to N of I equals N times N plus one. So we can say that the sum, the formula from I equals one to N of I equals n times n plus one divided by two. And that is one of the formulas. And again, she, won't, she says you don't have to memorize these, which is fine, which is great, but you still should be aware of them. So when I add up the first like 10 numbers, right, I could say the sum from i equals 1 to 10 of i, that's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way to 10, I can just use this formula to actually find what it is. Right? That's going to be here n is 10, so that's 10 times 11 over 2, which is 5 over 5 times 11, which is 55. But you could also see it as, oh yeah, I'm getting an 11 plus an 11 plus an 11 plus an 11 plus an 11. It's five elevens. Um, yeah, so that's kind of neat. So the other formulas are the sum from i equals one to n of i is n times n plus one over two. And then there is a way to derive the formula for i squared, but it's a little bit complicated. Um, and I don't really think we need to spend our time doing it. The sum from i equals 1 to n of i squared equals n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 
over six. And then there's one, there, I mean, there's actually literally a formula for every positive integer power of i. So you could do it for i cubed, for i to the fourth, for i to the fifth, and so on. But I don't really think that's super valuable to us right now. So these are the rules and formulas you probably want to be aware of when it comes to the summation notation. Um, yeah, there was something someone asked in class the previous hour that I did want to just, I don't know, I don't remember who asked it. I don't think there was anyone, I mean, not that it matters really who it was, but somebody asked, and I, and I wasn't sure if the question was really being addressed quite correctly. Somebody asked, like, when we have this, some i equals one to n of two i squared plus three over seven, why we can't just replace i squared with the formula for i squared, which is n times n plus one times two n plus one over six. And the reason we can't do that is because it's not true, right? I squared itself is not equal to n times n plus one times two n plus one over six. It's that the sum from i equals one to n of i squared is equal to this. So that's what's going on there. We're literally saying if you add up all the squares of the numbers, one squared plus two squared plus three squared plus four squared, plus all the way to n squared, that equals this. All right, in fact, I should say that. Because again, I think, I think kind of the meaning of some of this is getting a little bit glossed over. Right, so this really means, that's an i by the way, in case you didn't know, one squared plus two squared plus three squared plus four squared plus all the way to n squared. And that happens to add up to n times n plus one times two n plus one divided by six. Always. It's kind of cool. Um, so the reason she had to break this apart was so that she could use the fact that i squared was equal to the, so that the sum of i squared was equal to this. So she broke this up. She factored out the constant one seventh. And then to use the rule that says you can break apart a sum into two different sums. So this is one seventh times the sum from i equals one to n of two i squared plus the sum from i equals one to n of three. And then from this one, you can also factor out a two. So you can say this is equal to, and I can distribute the one seventh, I guess. So it's one seventh times two, so two sevenths times the sum from i equals one to n of i squared plus one seven times this. And now that we actually have just the sum from i equals one to n of i squared, then we can say, oh, that is equal to this. And so then we're allowed to actually replace all of this with what it's equal to. And that's actually what we end up doing a lot when we're trying to <clears throat> use the sum summation notation to calculate a Riemann sum, which we won't do very much, but we will do a little bit. So that's what's happening here, is we want to then say, oh yeah, we can write this as 2 sevenths times what this is equal to, which is n times n plus 1 times 2 n plus 1 over 6 plus 1 seventh times. We know this one also, right? That's your 3n, right? It's 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 n times. So that's kind of the deal here. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's much more to say about that. So, yeah, I think that's all I really want to say about sums. Um, there, I mean, there are some examples, some, you feel like there's a lot of bad puns to be made with sums, um, but I could say like, for example, what's the sum from i equals one to n of two i squared, uh, let's actually, let's use a real number, from i equals one to 10 of two i squared plus three i minus five. So if I actually wanted to find what this added up to, I would break it up into three distinct summands. I would write it as the or summations. Sum from i equals one to 10 of two i squared plus the sum from i equals one to 10 of five i 
minus the uh, sorry three i not five i minus the sum from i equals one to ten of five. And then I would probably actually also in one step pull these constant multiples out in front. So I put this two in front of the sigma. I would put this three in front of the sigma. And then I can use my formulas. I know that the sum from i equals one to n, where n is 10, is of i squared is n times n plus one times two plus one over six. So this is going to be two times, remember n is 10, so it's going to be 10 times 11 times 21 over 6. And then for this one, it's going to be 3 times n times n plus 1 over 2. So that's going to be 3 times 10 times 11 over 2. And then this one's going to be the sum of 5, 10 times is going to be 5 times 10. This is going to add to something. Um, the nice thing about this formula is it always, right, if you've got n times n plus 1 times 2 n plus 1 over 6, it's always going to be an integer. You can always cancel out. Like there's a factor of three here, and there's a factor of two here. So I end up with two times five times 11 times seven plus, and cancel two here, three times 55 minus 50. That's something. Um, 11 times seven is 77, times 10 is 770. So I've got 770. Three times 55 is 165. Minus 50, so that's 115 plus 770 is 885. But the point is that we can use these formulas. Really, we can use these formulas when n is just n, not when n is like 10 or 8 or anything specific. So let's go to the other side of things. Not literally, the other side of the board. I know, I crack myself up. Okay, um, so the reason we're talking about the sum of notation stuff is because we're going to use it when we are estimating area under a curve using either a left endpoint or a right endpoint or a midpoint or some other, you could use any point right here with a little star thing, um, but usually it's a left endpoint or a right endpoint. So let's talk about, this is not my favorite function to use, but we can use it. So you want to estimate the area under f of x equal to the square root of x on the interval a equals 0 to b equals 16 um, using four rectangles. So draw a picture here. It's four rectangles of equal width. You should generally assume that if someone is asking you to estimate an area under a curve using some number of rectangles, that the rectangles are equal width or the subintervals are equal width. Sometimes, and someone you someone asked that in class and she said, yeah. There, there are some weird cases where you might want unequal widths. You'll probably never have to worry about them in this class. So, um, uh, yeah, so draw a picture. So, the square root function looks kind of like this. And we're going from zero to, let's say, 16 is right here. Okay, so we're trying to estimate this area. And let's break it up into four equal sub intervals. So the length of our sub interval, which we usually call delta x, is always going to be b minus a divided by the number of sub intervals. In this case, that's going to be 16 minus 0 over 4. Right? So typically people write using n equal to 4 sub intervals. So n is usually the letter we're using for the number of sub intervals. Um, so that's going to be 4. I'm going to cut this up into four equal sections that are each having a width of four. So that's going to be four, that's going to be eight, that's going to be 12, that's going to be 16. And we can do this using really anything we want um, for each interval. So for this, let's use right endpoints first. So for this first interval, 
Here's the rectangle I get using a right endpoint. It's actually a square. So it's got the same base. And no, uh, it's not a square. I'm just draw, bad at drawing. It's not really a square. It just looks like a square. And then for the second interval, so in fact, uh, yeah. Mm, sorry, I'm trying to like. Right, so here are the regions I'm trying to estimate the areas of. And if I'm using right endpoints, I'm using for the second region, this endpoint, I'm giving the height there. For this third interval, the right endpoint, giving the height there. The fourth interval, the right interval. So this in red is going to be an estimate using right endpoints. And you can clearly see that in this example, it's going to be an overestimate. Um, overestimate never really depends purely on if it's a right or left. It depends on what kind of function you have. So since this function is increasing, a right endpoint estimate is going to be an overestimate. But if this function was decreasing, like the cosine one she was doing in class, a right endpoint estimate is going to be an underestimate. And then if it's increasing and decreasing, it's really not clear. Um, so here's what I want to find. So I usually kind of use a slightly different notation. Specifically, we often use this notation, R4, to mean not the area of just the fourth one here, but the area of the estimate, or sorry, it's the estimate of the area using right endpoints with four sub intervals. So typically I use R4 to mean that and not just the area of this part here. Um, because then I use Rn, like she was using Rn in class to say the estimate of the area using n intervals with right endpoints. So yeah, there's a slight notation. The notation there was a little, a little, maybe a little confusing, right? Because R1, R2, R3, and R4 are not meaning the same thing as Rn, the way she was writing it. But I wouldn't stress too much about that. So here, R4 is going to be, so all the bases are the same, right? The base here is 4, 4, 4, 4. So each rectangle has a base of 4. And then the heights are f of 4, f of 8, f of 12, f of 16. Which you could write like this. You could also write this in summation notation. You could write this as the sum from i equals one to four, right? We have four intervals. We're starting with the first one and the last one. And then it's going to be four, your base, times your height, which is going to be f of f of something. So it's going to be f of Sorry, I'm like, what's it going to be? It's going to be f of four times i, where this four is your delta x, and your i is how many you've got. So right. So I guess I should really write it as. No, that's fine. I was going to write it as zero plus four i. Right. So the left endpoint is zero, and but we want to start at the right endpoint. So we add when i is one, we add four. When i is 2, we add 8. When i is 3, we add 12. When i is 4, we add 16. So you can write it this way as well. We could actually calculate it, right? This ends up being 4 times the square root of 4 plus the square root of 8 plus the square root of 12 plus the square root of 16, which is approximately, what have I got here? 49.17. Uh, that's not really like showing us a whole lot. This is just kind of like, okay, yeah, that's how much area is in the red, which is definitely an overestimate. We could also use left endpoints. So I can look at the same region. Instead of using the right endpoints for each rectangle, or for each, I should say, instead of using the right endpoints for each region, because they're not rectangles, we're estimating their areas with rectangles. Using left endpoints, I'm going to get, right, that's the height. So I get a rectangle with zero height. And then that's the height. 
and then that's the height, and then that's the height. So I would say that L4 clearly going to be an underestimate. And it's going to be given by, well, again, the base is delta x, which is 4, times the sum of all the heights. So that's going to be f of 0 plus f of 4 plus f of 12 plus f of 6. Oh, I forgot 8, sorry, plus f of 8 plus f of 12. Which again, we could write in the sigma notation if we really wanted to. That's the sum from i equals 1 to 4 of delta x times f of i minus 1 times 4. Right? If i equals 1, then we start with f of 0. And then when i equals 2, we get f of 4. When i equals 3, we get f of 8. When i equals 4, we get f of 12. Okay. Which, I mean, this is going to end up being either way four times the square root of zero plus the square root of four plus the square root of eight plus the square root of 12, which ends up approximately being something. Uh, where'd you go? Ah, come here. About 33.17. So here's what we have. We have the, the actual area under the curve. We have narrowed it down to being between 33.17 and 49.17. Kind of a big margin of error there, right? So the question that I don't want to draw pictures for is how do we make our estimate better? Well, we could use midpoints, but that's not what I really want to do. What I want to do is I want to show you. Oh yeah, we can, yeah, we can definitely go over midpoints for sure. But let me, let me show you this first and then we'll talk about midpoints. So we can totally use more rectangles to get a better estimate, right? If you compare this estimate where we're using eight intervals with the right endpoints, you can just see graphically compared to the original one that here, you have a lot more in these regions here, a lot more overestimate. Whereas if we go back down to this one, you can see that you're, you're missing like all that overestimate there and all the overestimate there and all that. So you're cutting off a lot of the overestimate when you use more intervals. Similarly, you don't have as big an underestimate if you use more intervals. Um, and so when you do it that way, I don't want to do the math there, but you do definitely tighten your interval. So yeah. To get a more accurate estimate, we could totally use more subintervals. We could also use midpoints. So the only thing about midpoints, and I feel like I should do an example that's maybe a little more, like I'm not really doing the computation here, which I don't think is particularly helpful. So let's actually do an example where we can compute some stuff. Um, sorry, I wanted to stop sharing my screen. Where'd you go button? There you are button. Um, yeah, definitely go over midpoint. So let's look at a different example and we'll do, we'll do all three for this next example. So let's say I want to find, I want to approximate, want to approximate the area under, what do I want to make it not too terrible, but not too easy. Let's make it under, what's not too terrible, but not too easy. Mm, y equal to, sorry, I'm trying to like, I'm trying to straddle the line between not too terribly computational and not too super easy. Let's see y equals nine minus x squared um, on the interval from zero to three with, oh yeah, we could do four is gonna be terrible. Yeah, let's do n equal to six. So here's our picture. And so I will honestly say for your picture, you don't really need the function. You really just need the x-axis. I'm still gonna draw the function, but I really only need the x-axis. So here's my picture. It's a downward opening parabola. 
It looks kind of like this. It exactly intersects the x-axis at the point three zero. So I'm going to break this up into six subintervals. So my delta x is three minus zero over six, which is one half. And that's how long each interval is going to be. So I'm starting at zero. And I'm just going to make them look nice. So zero, and then the next one's at one half and then two halves, and then three halves, and then four halves, and then five halves, and then six halves, which is three. So those are my endpoints of each interval. So here are my, right, here are my regions. So let's write down how we would do right endpoints and left endpoints real quick. So for the area, using right endpoints with six subintervals, the area is approximately R6. If the area is what it's actually supposed to be, R6 is our approximation. That's again, the estimate using right endpoints with six subintervals. And that's gonna equal, well, again, it's your delta X times the sum from I equals one to six of F of X sub I. So this notation I'm using here, this f of x of i, typically what we call things when we write this, so this first spot here, this is x sub zero. This, so in the first subinterval, the left endpoint is x zero, the right endpoint is x one. In the second interval, the left is x one, the right is x two. So in each subinterval, the right endpoint is x sub that subinterval's number. So this is the first one, there's x sub one. This is the second one, there's x sub two. This is the third one, there's x sub three. There's x sub four. There's x sub five. There's x sub six. So what I'm really saying here is I'm going to add up delta x times f of x one plus delta x times f of x two plus delta x times f of x three. So we're gonna get, Delta X, which is one half times this, which is F of X one plus F of X two plus all the way to F of X sub six. So this is where the computation becomes gross, right? I don't really want to actually compute the things, but I want to show you what we do, right? So to get this, we're just plugging things into the function, nine minus x squared. So x1 is one half, so I'm gonna get nine minus one half squared. Plus x2 is one, right? Just, so each next point is just delta x away. So if the first one is one half, the next one is one half plus one half, the next one is half plus one half. So it's gonna be nine minus one squared plus nine minus three halves squared plus nine minus two squared plus nine minus five halves squared plus nine minus three squared. And that is how we would calculate the approximation using six endpoints, sorry, six subintervals with right endpoints. Um, are there questions about this? I will mention, we could use one of the formulas here, right? If you really wanted to, I'm gonna to go to the other side. This is where things get a little bit kind of interesting. So we could totally say, well, um, my F of X, I, so this is where you can, I'm trying to think like, how detailed do we really want to be about this? It's kind of a fine line to straddle. So, um, yeah. So X sub zero is A, which is zero in this case. X sub one is zero plus one half. X sub two is zero plus two times one half. X sub I is zero plus I times delta X. 
or more generally, x sub i is a plus i times delta x. That's always true. So I know that x sub 0 in this case is 0. x sub 1 is 0 plus 1 times delta x, which is 1 plus 1 half. x sub 2 is 0 plus 2 times 1 half, which is going to be 1. Um, the reason I mentioned that is because if we wanted to, we could throw that all into this expression here and use the formulas. I don't think that's really what we want to do, though. Adding this up is kind of not fun, but you could do it. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we'll do it like that. So then for the same thing, I'm, good, I'm just going to draw the x-axis this time. Again, right, we're going from 0 to 3. We're breaking it up into six subintervals where we have x sub 0 is 0 x sub 1 is 1 half, x sub 2 is 1, x sub 3 is 3 halves, x sub 4 is 2, x sub 5 is 5 halves, and x sub 3, sorry, x sub 6. So if you're, if you're writing, if you're looking at your interval broken up into subintervals, you should always end with x sub n, where n is the number of subintervals. And you should always start with x sub 0. Um, my 6 looks terrible. Though. So I want to use left endpoints. It's going to be the same sort of deal, except it's going to be delta x times the sum from i equals 1 to 6 of f of x sub i minus 1 which is just going to be, in this case, again, our delta x is 1 half, and it's going to be f of x sub 0 plus f of x sub 1 plus all the way to f of x sub 6, which I'm loath to write out, because really you could just say it's going to be this. If you don't have this last one, you have the first one over here, but we can write it out. So again, our function, remember, is nine minus x squared. So this would end up being one half times. So x of zero is, right, that's zero. That's one half all the way to, oh, so I made a small mistake here. It's not terrible, but it is a mistake. I shouldn't be ending with x of six, right? This has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven terms, but there should only be six terms because I'm only ending up the area of six rectangles. Um, and when I plug in 6, I should get f of x sub 6 minus 1, which is x sub 5. So I should actually get an x sub 5, which is x equal to 5 halves. So calculating this, f of x sub 0 is 9 minus 0 squared. And then f of x sub 1 is 9 minus 1 half squared. And then 9 minus the next one, which is 1, right? squared, and then the next one is 3 halves, and then the next one is 2, and then the next one is 5 halves. The last one is 5 halves. And that's because, again, right, for each of these seven intervals now, we are using the left end points. So the first one we're using 0. For the second one, we're using 1. The, or you know the first the the x sub one left endpoint. For this third one, we're using x sub two, which is one. For this fourth one, we're using x sub three, which is three halves. So for right endpoints, the interval and the endpoint number match. Right for right endpoints, first interval x sub one is your right endpoint. Second interval x sub two. Third interval x sub three. Fourth interval. X but for left endpoints, the left endpoint is always one less than the interval number, meaning for your first subinterval, the left endpoint is x sub 0. For your second subinterval, the left endpoint is x sub 1. For your third subinterval, the left endpoint is x sub 2, and so on and so on and so on. So that's why for the right endpoints, you get x sub i, whereas for the left endpoints, you get x sub i minus 1. Cool. Okay, so now let's, so again, we could calculate this. I don't think there's really a lot of value either, right? You could definitely calculate that on your own. 
I would probably do nine plus nine plus nine plus nine plus nine plus nine is 54. And then minus zero squared plus one fourth plus one plus nine fourths plus four plus whatever that 25 was. And then midpoint. Midpoint's kind of a pain. I mean, it's not really that much more of a pain. It's just that then you have you have to now find new points to evaluate at. So midpoint, you're obviously not using the left or the right, you're using the midpoint. So for M6, which would be the area approximated by midpoints with six set intervals, you're gonna use midpoint to each of these. So you can either you can write it very fancily as delta x times the sum from i equals one to six of f of so here's the thing for an interval like let's say for the second interval here right you don't want to use x1 or x2 you actually want to use the average of x1 and x2 so you actually are going to do x i minus one plus x i all over two no one does that like we could do it that way but here's what people really do They look at the thing, they're like, okay, where are the midpoints? Well, okay. So my delta x again is one half. And then the first midpoint between zero and one half is one fourth. And then the second midpoint between one half and one is three fourths. Now, the nice thing about the midpoints is they're all still delta x apart from each other, right? All of our right endpoints or left endpoints were all one half away from each other. They were one half and then one and then three halves and then two and then five halves and then three. Well, for the left ones, they were zero, one half, one, three halves, two, five halves. As long as their sub intervals are equal in length, if you're using left endpoints or right endpoints or midpoints, they're all going to be the same width apart from each other. So once you know that the first midpoint is at one fourth and you know that your sub interval length is one half, you can just add one half to the next one. One fourth plus one half is three fourths. Three fourths plus one half, which is two fourths, is five fourths. Five fourths plus two fourths is seven fourths. Seven fourths plus two fourths is nine fourths. And let's say I have one, two, three, four, five, I need six. So nine fourths plus two fourths is 11 fourths. That's how I would do midpoints. And then, I mean, again, the cut, right? So then you're going to write this out as one half times f of one fourth, which is nine minus one fourth squared, plus f of three fourths, which is nine minus three fourths squared, nine minus five fourths squared, nine minus seven fourths squared, right? It's a big pain in the butt. But that's how you do midpoints. So whether it's left endpoints, right endpoints, or midpoints, it's always the same number of things. It just depends on what you're plugging in. Right? For left endpoint, I mean, the words speak for themselves. For left endpoints, you're plugging in the left endpoint for each subsequent interval. For right endpoints, you're plugging in the right endpoint for each subsequent interval. And for midpoints, you're plugging in the midpoint. Um, yeah, that's kind of all there is to say about this. So I wish we had more time. We don't. Um, let me say a couple more words. So hopefully this helps you calculate things. Um, what I want to say is here's where we're going with this. So the idea is that what we could actually do is say, I'm going to take this function, 9 minus x squared, and instead of breaking it up into six sub-intervals, oh, sorry, on the interval from 0 to 3, instead of breaking it up into six or 10 or 20, we're going to break it up into some arbitrary number of subintervals n. So we're going to break this up into n subintervals. So the width of each of those is going to be three minus zero over n, which is three over n. And so here's what it's going to look like. I know we're just about out of time, but give me just a minute because I think I think this is worth seeing. Um, so here's my function, which looks kind of super stupid. I know it's my point three comma zero. I want to give myself a lot of width here, though. Right? This is the point zero nine. 
So I'm breaking this up into n pieces. So here's x sub zero, here's x sub one, here's x sub two, here's x sub three, that, that, that. Here is some x sub i minus one, here's some x sub i. And then the last one is gonna be x sub n. And then the second to last one is gonna be x sub n minus one. So right, I have n sub intervals. Here is the first sub interval or region. Here is the second region. Here is the third region. So notice again, I just wanna make this super clear, the region number and the right endpoint number always match. So over here at the ith sub interval, right, it's the ith one. I know it's the ith one because the i matches the i down here. And this last one is the nth one because the n matches the n there. And so what we're going to do, and we'll have to save this till next time, but we're going to find a way of expressing the sum of the rectangles using either right or left. If I was going to use right, for example, using right, Rn is going to be very, very generically the sum from i equals one to n of the base, the base is delta x, times the height of each rectangle, which is f of x1, f of x2, f of x3, f of xi. So it's f of x sub i. So we start at one, we get f of x1, and then two, f of x2, three, f of x3. And so then what we're going to do next time, because I, I keep saying next time, like I'm going to stop talking, really. So what we're going to do next time, I promise I won't do any more now, is we're going to figure out a formula for x sub i, which is going to be based on where we start and where we end and how wide it is. Um, in fact, I did say it earlier, x sub i is just going to be a plus i times delta x. And here's what's going to happen. It's going to be really cool. Be kind of cool. We're going to plug in that formula, and then we're going to plug it into the form into the function. So we're going to get like nine minus some crazy thing squared times delta x, which is just three over n. And then we're going to have some summation thing that has like i and i squared in it. And then we're going to use those formulas for the sum of i and sum of i squared to actually write this as something with n's in it. And then we're going to take the limit. As n goes to infinity, because the thing that Karana was ending with it was she was saying, oh yeah, the area is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the approximated area using n intervals with right endpoints. You could also use left endpoints or midpoints, but the right endpoint is kind of the standard choice, but all of them actually give them the same results. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to find a way to express r sub n in terms of just n, and then we're gonna take the limit and we're actually gonna calculate the area under the curve, the longest way possible. And then after that, we will talk about how you can just use antiderivatives and the fundamental theorem of calculus. But you have to walk before you can run. So we have to do this first so that we can appreciate how great it is to not have to do this later on. All right, you guys, I hope that was somewhat illuminating and helpful.